If you were ever a child, you're familiar with Disney. Although I don't believe it to be essential before I dive into any stock, I like to become familiar with the history. How did the company I'm studying become what it is today? I do this because one, I'm entrepreneurial and I love learning from business history. But more than that, it provides me with important context about the decisions the company is making today. And it can help me understand the implications those decisions can have on the stock's price. So that's what I'm gonna do for you today. By the end of this, you're going to know everything important there is to know about the making of the Walt Disney Company. Hi, my name is Steven Spicer, and it's my goal to help you invest smarter. Now, if you're here because you're interested in some business history, I might do some more of those, depending on how this one goes. So subscribe if you'd like. But if you're here to learn from a practicing professional how to invest smarter, well, you should definitely, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. Before we get into the history of Disney, I put together a short quiz just for fun to see how much you know about it. The link is towards the top of the description and in the pinned comment below. I recommend you pause this video right now, go take the quiz, and then come back and let us know how you did in the comments. But you should do that now if you can, because if you wait and watch this whole thing first, well, you'll know all the answers. Now, a proper introduction to the birth of the Disney company starts with an introduction to Walt Disney. He was born in Chicago in 1901, and he developed an early interest in drawing. By the age of 18, he was working as a commercial illustrator, and at 20, he co-owned his own animation company called Laughagram Studio. Now, the cartoon shorts that he made there were popular, but didn't bring in enough income to keep his business solvent. His firm went into bankruptcy in 1923, when Disney was just 22 years old. He moved to Hollywood to be with his brother Roy and tried to sell Alice's Wonderland, the last animation that he had made before Laughagram went under. Later that year, Margaret J. Winkler of MJ Winkler Productions agreed to pay the Disney brothers $1,500 per reel. Following that news, the brothers formed the Disney Brothers Cartoon Studio, the business that would ultimately evolve into the company that we know today. Later, through Winkler Pictures, Disney created his first original character, and no, it wasn't Mickey Mouse. He created 26 shorts of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Unfortunately, in February 1928, due to a legal loophole, when Charles Mintz, Winkler's husband, took over the distribution company, Disney lost that contract and Oswald. And that's not all he lost. Mintz, after failing to take over the Disney studio as a whole, hired away four of Disney's five primary animators. The one who stayed behind was his longtime friend of iWorks. Walt tried to not be discouraged. In 1928, inspired by a mouse that he pulled from his trash can and then kept on his desk during his time at Laughagram, he created his next character, originally named Mortimer Mouse. Ub, that one animator that stayed with Disney, refined his initial design to give us the iconic mouse that the world fell in love with. And Walt's wife, Lillian, told him that Mortimer sounded too pompous, so she suggested Mickey instead. After creating and failing with a couple Mickey Mouse shorts, his third attempt, Steamboat Willie, was an immediate smash hit, although they did end up creating an edited version after accusations of cruelty to animals. 1929 was a big year for the future of the Disney Corporation. They continued to create cartoons starring Mickey and other original characters. They partnered with Columbia Pictures to create the Silly Symphonies series. The Mickey Mouse Club was created, the Mickey Mouse comic strip was put into its first newspaper, and the company was reorganized as a corporation with the name Walt Disney Productions. This success allowed him to push the animation boundaries even further. In 1937, after three years in production, Disney released its first feature-length animated film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Within two years, it became the highest grossing film of its time. Using the profits from Snow White, Disney financed the construction of its 51-acre headquarters in Burbank, California, where they're still headquartered to this day. That paved the way for Walt Disney Productions' initial public offering on April 2nd, 1940. The company continued producing animated shorts and features like Pinocchio, Fantasia, Dumbo, and Bambi. 
But then, after the start of World War II, the company had to shift its focus. The government commissioned Disney to create pro-war propaganda films, like Der Fuhrer's Face, originally titled Donald Duck in Nutsy Land, and Education for Death. I mean, come on, I don't know how that's not a modern day classic. If you enjoyed that, take a moment, please, to hit the like button uh, on this video. Thank you, I, I really do appreciate it. And needless to say, during and a little after the war, business was slow. But after the release of Cinderella in 1950, Disney started to once again see massive success. So much so that in 1953, it formed its own distribution arm, Buena Vista Distribution. In 1955, Disney's dream of creating a magical place where parents and children can have fun at the same time finally came to fruition with the opening of Disneyland. As Disney expanded the size and international popularity of the park, it still managed to churn out hit after hit after hit after hit. And in 1965, Disney World was announced after the company purchased thousands of acres in Florida. Sadly, on December 15th, 1966, Walt Disney died. His brother Roy took over as chairman, CEO, and president of the company. And one of the first things Roy did was to rename Disney World to Walt Disney World in honor of his brother's vision. Despite Walt's passing, the company continued to release several well-received and well-known films. In October 1971, Walt Disney World opened to the public. And on December 20th, 1971, Roy Disney died of a stroke. As you might expect, the company then struggled for a bit under new leadership. The company released several films over the following decade with mixed results. In 1983, the Disney Channel made its debut as a subscription level channel on cable networks nationwide. In 1984, then CEO and Walt's son-in-law, Ron Miller, created Touchstone Films to help Disney release more major motion pictures. But really, through most of the 70s and into the 80s, it was Walt Disney World that received most of the company's attention. Inspired by Walt's vision of a futuristic model city, the next Florida-based theme park, the Epcot Center, opened in 1982. Then, Tokyo Disneyland opened the following year in April 1983. But while their theme parks were thriving, Disney's production arm was unable to keep up with other studios. In fact, in the early 1980s, the parks were generating 70% of the company's revenue. And although management successfully fended off a hostile takeover bid from Saul Steinberg's Reliance Group Holdings in 1984, shareholders wanted change. Accordingly, the board brought in Michael Eisner from Paramount to serve as CEO. Over the following years, Eisner used Touchstone to crank out hit after hit after hit after hit. <laughs> He also pushed the company into television syndication with The Golden Girls and Home Improvement, and then began the period known today as the Disney Renaissance, where the company returned to its roots and created a series of wildly successful films, including Who Framed Roger Rabbit, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and The Lion King. At the same time, they produced several television series, many that I remember from my childhood, that did very well. In 1991, Disney became a Dow Jones Industrial Component Company, and in 95, Disney purchased the ABC network and its assets, which included A&E and ESPN networks. But the following decade didn't prove quite as successful as Eisner's first. The company created the Mighty Ducks NHL team, which they later sold. They purchased a majority stake in the Anaheim Angels, which they later sold. During this time, they did start to venture into the internet space with their Go network, and they did launch their cruise line. But after the September 11th attacks, years of box office flops, multiple lawsuits, a failed attempt to buy Universal Studios, the fending off of an unsolicited $54 billion bid from Comcast to buy out Disney altogether, complaints specifically from Roy E. Disney, Roy Disney's son, about Eisner's micromanagement and his transforming of the Walt Disney Company into a rapacious and soulless company, and with the stock hovering around 52-week lows, Eisner finally seated the board chairmanship. And on March 13, 2005, it was announced that he would be replaced by Robert Iger as CEO. 
It's been under Iger's management that we've seen some pretty significant deals that have shaped the Disney we know today. Notably, their 2006 $7.4 billion acquisition of Pixar, their 2009 $4.2 billion acquisition of Marvel Entertainment, and their 2012 $4.1 billion acquisition of Lucasfilm. In 2017, Disney announced that they'll be starting their own streaming service, Disney Plus, by the end of 2019. They also announced their intention to merge with 21st Century Fox in a deal worth $52.4 billion. Everything was proceeding as planned until in mid-2018, Comcast announced their bid for Fox of $65 billion. Disney quickly responded with a $71.3 billion counter, but this Comcast rivalry, which has reared its ugly head a few times over the last couple decades, is a relevant headwind to Disney's future success and will come up again in a future video. Aside from rounding out Disney's ownership of the Marvel Cinematic Universe with the X-Men, Fantastic Four, and others, this Fox merger brings with it even more franchise titles with cult followings, like The Simpsons, Family Guy, and The X-Files, to name a few. And that brings us to today, 2019, where in this year alone, we await the completion of that aforementioned merger, where Marvel fans eagerly anticipate a blockbuster finale a decade in the making, where Star Wars fans cautiously await the completion of the first Star Wars themed park, and where Disney Plus will debut with its sights set on the streaming king Netflix. Needless to say, it should be an eventful and exciting year for Disney. Disney's is obviously a very robust history. If you feel I've left something out, anything important, please share with us in the comments. And as for any commentary as to my opinions on and how I personally play Disney stock, well, that's coming up next. So don't forget to subscribe. And if you'd like for me to just email you my full analysis of Disney or whatever stock I've most recently covered, go to spicercapital.com forward slash stock. Let me know there and I'll just go ahead and send everything over right now. Whatever you do, just keep doing everything you can to try to invest smarter. I hope that I can help. Take care.